This is a session on Sonics IQ Next Generation Gas Metering. Uh, this is being presented by Paul Honchar. Paul is the Senior Man Product Manager for Census. He's responsible for all aspects of product marketing for the gas turbo meter and Sonics meter lines. He has a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Pitt, Pittsburgh, um, and has more than 40 years experience in the gas industry. Thank you. Uh, and like um, all of the conferences, we have to say, uh, you know, take the survey at the end of the course uh, so we can improve and, and serve you better. Okay, so we're going to talk about the next generation in gas metering, which is the Sonics IQ meter. Uh, it's been in development for four or five years now, but um, we've been in the single path ultrasonic measurement arena uh, for about 30 or 35 years now. So the presentation is going to sort of take the evolution of how we got to where we are now and some of it, all, some of it deals with all the lessons that we've learned along the way um, to actually make the Sonics IQ a lot better uh, than some of the previous models that we have. So in um, 1987, British Gas actually announced a contest, a competition, and they wanted a meter the size of a brick, a house brick. Um, that was the criteria. So there were actually four proposals, or 21 proposals that were submitted, and four were selected for further development and actually funding by British Gas. Two of them were ultrasonic, one was fluidic, and one was silicon beam. Um, out of those, in 1990, they asked for prototypes, and we submitted, uh, actually, the uh, Gill Research submitted one, which we actually acquired the rights to, which ultimately became the Sonics technology as we know it. Um, and they tested them for six months, and two of them were very promising, the Gill R&D and Siemens. Uh, the Siemens meter uh, is actually a bounce. The, the ultrasonic sound wave, uh, the transducers are here and here and they actually bounce the wave down the flow tube and the, the length of the flow path or the length of the sound waves critical to the measurement uh, of natural gas through the flow tube itself. Plus it also has to do with the frequency at which the transducers are, are sending the sound wave uh, down the pipeline. So some of the ultrasonic meters you'll see them bouncing to get a longer cord length to get it more accurate in the, the lighter natural gas. Um, the second one, the Gill uh, Research and Development Group, which actually is the sonics technology that we know of today, um, sort of used a bounce, but the flow would come down through the flow tube. There was a conditioning rod in the middle of the flow tube, and then the flow would exit out. There's a partition on the unmeasured side of the meter on the inlet side and the measured gas on the outlet side. The transducers would send a sound wave bounce it off a reflective wall, down the flow tube, and then back to the uh, receiving transducer. When the receiving transducer received the signal, um, it would bounce the uh, sound wave against the flow. And then we just looked at the speed up and the slow down of the timing um, with the flow and against the flow, averaged that out, and we came up with the velocity through the flow tube. An interesting characteristic, and it was actually patented at one time, was this uh, additional, we call it a speed of sound transducer, and it sat in a no-flow area uh, in the meter, but it was still exposed to the natural gas composition. So we actually knew the speed of sound in the exact composition going through the meter. We relayed that information to the two working transducers, and it allowed it the, the meter to be more accurate. It gave us some self-diagnostic capabilities and it also would detect whether the meter's in air or natural gas if somebody's trying to steal gas and, and swap the meter out. So the third transducer actually sent and received its own signal about every 40 seconds and then we used that for subsequent volumetric measurement with the two measuring transducers. So after the development, we actually came up with what we called the Sonics E6 meter. Uh, British Gas primarily, or British Gas was the primary 
uh, purchaser of all of the meters. They actually bought 1.3 million meters, uh, basically starting in 1993 through about 2000. Um, and it's a European design meter. They have a lot different specifications than we do here in North America. A lot of their meters are in inside closets and they don't run as high of pressure as we do. Um, so it was designed specifically for that particular market. In 2000, we brought that technology to North America. We called it the uh, Sonics 215 meter, or if you got it in metric, it was the Sonic 6, 6 cubic meters, or 215 cubic feet. And you'll see that in a lot of our products where the capacity of the product is somehow part of the model name. Um, R275 residential diaphragm meters 275. In this case, it was a, a 215 meter. Um, very, very good meter, and it fit in uh, aesthetic applications. Uh, remodeled sections of towns that wanted a very nice looking meter. They didn't want the big clunky diaphragm meter there. Um, and in where space was of a premium, it fit very well. Um, because you're paying very expensive square foot uh, real estate in some of these high-rise apartments in some of the bigger cities. Um, it fit that application very well, but it was expensive. It was three times the cost of a diaphragm meter. Okay, So obviously we didn't replace the diaphragm meter market with it because the diaphragm meter is still a, a very good meter. It still lasts 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and, and at that time, the Sonics 215 um, didn't have enough value-added features to, to charge three times the cost. So in 2007, we basically put it on the shelf, and we further developed what we called the industrial commercial line of the meters, which were very, very price competitive. Uh, we, had a, we still have and currently offer it today. Sonic 600 and a Sonic 880 introduced them in 2002. And like I said, we got about 81,000 meters in, in service. And what we actually did was when we came out with this meter, it replaced our mechanical diaphragm meters in the same capacity, the 750, 1600, and 1000 diaphragm meters. Um, and we actually tripled our sales. So we not only replaced our sales of the diaphragm meter in that class, we also took um, uh, uh, volumes, if you will, from the competition. So about uh, 15,000 meters a year, 10,000 of that was from a traditional diaphragm meter market not sold by census at the time. Accuracy of these meters are very, very stable. Nothing to wear out, nothing to change. And Measurement Canada has an attestation program where the meter typically gets a six-year seal initially. Um, and then you can petition after four years of meters in service um, for a longer seal life. So we did that, and the Sonics 880 was approved by Measurement Canada for a 10-year seal. So it saves a whole lot of infrastructure, a whole lot of pulling meters, a whole lot of resealing and re-verifying meters in Canada um, because it's basically the only meter in that class that um, has a 10-year seal life. All the other meters in that class have a six-year seal life. So some of the applications are um, your Pizza Hut, your Burger Kings, your fast food chains, your motels. Um, we actually found an application where the meter was very good at wellheads um, because we actually added a drain to the bottom of the meter. And these were older wells, basically in my part of the world, in the Appalachian mountain chain, that are um, depleting, but they're still producing 700,000 cubic foot an hour, maybe at like 10 to 14 pounds. But once in a while, the well will burp and you'll get liquids and contaminants up through it. Mechanical meters would clog up, bind up, and eventually just stop working, uh, where we found out if we put this drain, about every 30 or 45 days when the technicians would go around and read the meters, they'd open up the drain, drain the liquids off, and as long as the liquids didn't get up into the flow tube, um, the meters kept working. They've been out there for about five years now. Uh, also, 
uh, strip malls and uh, plazas where uh, you have a clothing store and you may only need a diaphragm meter because they may only have a hot water tank in there. If they move out and a restaurant moves in and they bring their cookers and fryers and, and what have you, um, the diaphragm meter, the residential diaphragm meters, no uh, longer meets the capacity requirements of that new restaurant. Because the Sonics meters have six inch center to center, you can simply drop out a 275 capacity meter, put in a 600 or 880 meter, and now you've basically doubled or tripled the capacity without any plumbing. Just change out the meter and off you go. Um, the accuracy, the low flow accuracy of the, the Sonics meter is such that it'll still measure a pilot load. So it'll measure down to a quarter cubic foot per hour, the same as a residential diaphragm meter. And we see this a lot, a lot of applications for that particular meter um, when you put in an instantaneous hot water tank. Um, they're a couple hundred cubic foot by themselves. The residential diaphragm meter no longer fits that application, so you can easily upscale the meter um, to a 600 or an 880, six inch center to center, whatever connection sizes you, you typically use. And again, you don't have to to re-plumb and put a big diaphragm meter on a very good looking home or on a, in a very aesthetically pleasing area. In 2007, we introduced what we call the Sonics 2000. It's a bigger capacity meter. It's good for 60 pounds. And one advantage is it has a live pressure transducer option where now you basically have a mini electronic volume corrector built right into uh, the meter itself. Uh, we found that to be very, very interesting. Um, and moving on to ultrasonic sound waves, we can hear somewhere between 20 and 20,000 hertz. All of the ultrasonic meter technologies are well above that. The, our traditional sonic meters run about 160,000 hertz. The new Sonics IQ meter runs about 400,000 uh, hertz. So they're very, very high uh, frequencies. And we use the time of flight to do the measurement. Um, and some of you may be familiar with multi-path ultrasonic meters. Um, they're usually measuring 8-inch diameter pipe size meters or larger. So they have to take velocity samples across different uh, cross sections of the flow area to get an average velocity through the meter itself to make the meter accurate. Our flow rates in our flow tubes in the uh, single path ultrasonic meters um, are very small. So we don't have those differences in the velocity flow profiles going down the meter. So we can get away with a single pair of transducers measuring the speed up and the slow down of the gas flowing through the flow tube itself actually helps us with keeping the cost uh, commercially available so that uh, you can afford to purchase a meter with this type of technology. So the, the heart of the meter are the transducers themselves. They both send and receive the sound waves. They are our own design, we develop them. You just can't go out into the open market and purchase. You can, but you can't purchase uh, ultrasonic transducers to the quality that we need to stand up in the natural gas and, and to be as accurate as, as needed. So basically, they are velocity measuring devices, and we just measure the velocity in the speed up and the slow down of the uh, velocity through the flow tube against the area and we come up with the flow rate or the volume through the meter. Again, talking about the transducers, the piezoelectric elements, the heart of it, we do have a quarter wave plate which acts as an amplifier and then we cap it off on the front side. The back side, we actually put a, a dampening compound there um, because it's sort of like a megaphone that a cheerleader may use. We want to try to direct that sound in a, a particular direction. If we just excited that piezoelectric element, the sound would be omnidirectional and bouncing off a bunch of different components within the meter, and then we wouldn't know if we really received the sound wave or if 
um, it was a reflection off of something inside the meter. So in the uh, traditional sonics meters that we have, we bounce the signal off, it comes down the flow tube into the receiving transducer. The receiving transducer sends its own signal and, and back up into the, um, the upstream transducer. And the speed of sound actually uh, cancels out of the equation. So the velocity is basically the length between the face of the face of the transducers and the speed up and the slow down of the timing. Uh, very simple equation, but getting the ability to measure what that velocity is, there's a lot of engineering and technology in the background happening. So we actually measure the, um, the speed of sound two ways. There's a, court, uh, a course clock pulse measurement, um, and we have to measure down the nanoseconds, 10 to the minus 9 seconds. I'm a mechanical engineer. I have no idea what a nanosecond is. I can't phantom it, I can't see it, I can't touch it. Um, but all of our electronic uh, engineers know what that is and, and can very accurately measure that. But we have to measure the 10 to the minus 9 seconds to make the meter accurate, plus or minus 1% in natural gas environment. And how we do that is when we send this uh, sound wave, we measure the quark clock pulses, and then when the downstream transducer receives it, it stops the, the clock. But when we send that signal, we actually put a phase change in the sound wave, and that's a marker so that now we can interpolate in between that last clock pulse to get us down to the nanosecond. Okay. So all of that's happening in the background to get us the measurement accuracy that we need. So in the residential, uh, what was the Sonics uh, 215 meter, uh, the two working transducers were here. In the current 600 and 880, the flow tube's rectangular. Um, there's a partition here that separates unmeasured gas on the inlet side. This is actually the outlet chamber, and the two transducers are actually shooting the sound wave across the diagonal, so we get a representative uh, velocity across the entire flow profile. In the 2000, uh, we basically took two 880 flow tubes and stacked them on top of each other. So we have a pair of transducers measuring a flow tube on the top side, and a second pair of transducers measuring the flow on the bottom side. We just sum the volume between the two flow tubes, and that determines the, uh, the, the volume that is measured in that particular cycle. Talked about the speed of sound box. Again, it, it sends and receives its own signal. It lets us uh, actually make the meter uh, more accurate. It diagnoses the meter's health and provides tamper and theft detection. So after about 30 or 35 years of all this development, um, we decided to come back into the residential arena with what we're calling the Sonics IQ. Um, and there's, again, no moving parts in it. And it's a dual class meter. I mean, it's two, two different meters. We're going to sell one as a 250 meter and one as a 400 meter. It's actually the capacity is 425 cubic foot per hour. Both of them are at 10 pounds maximum allowable operating pressure. So we're not going to deal with five pounds with a 10 pound options. Everything's going to standardize on the, the 10 pound. And it has the integral FlexNet radio built right inside it. It's right on the same board as all the metrology components. So that allows one asset um, for both the radio and for the metrology to be tracked together. No longer do you have to track the asset of the meter and then track the radio. And they may have separate lives because you may have upgraded them separately. Uh, and now what, you, now what do you do with a, a radio that has... 10 years life on it, and the meter's actually 20 years, uh, and it's being changed out. So one meter, one asset, uh, makes everything a whole lot simple. Again, it'll be the only 400-class um, meter in a single-path ultrasonic technology out in the market in North America. 20-year battery life. 
Uh, all the traditional Sonics meters are a 10-year battery life. So all the new electronics in the meter, the transducers, all the firing and measuring schemes have allowed us to go to a 20-year battery life. The battery is not uh, changeable out in the field. Uh, it's basically at the end of 20 years, the meter needs replaced. Um, but we did all of that to try to keep the costs down uh, so that the, the Sonics IQ meter is, is economical in that residential uh, market. 90-day hourly data log. The traditional Sonics meters only have a 60-day hourly data log. So you get date, time, corrected, uncorrected, max, min, average temperature. Uh, if you get the meter with the valve and pressure, you'll get max, min, and average pressure for every hour for the last 90 days. If you're using our FlexNet system, all of that information is continuously set back into the, the back end through the RNIs. Um, the LCD is going to be uh, scrolling and configurable. So if you just want to see uncorrected volume, then it'll just display uncorrected volume. But you can have it scroll between uncorrected volume, corrected volume, pressure, temperature, um, flow rate so that it'll just automatically continue to scroll through uh, the different uh, selections. Again, all user configurable. If you want it, it's there. If you don't want it, okay, we'll just show you the index. Built-in diagnostics and alarms. Um, one definite advantage with the electronic platforms in uh, the single path ultrasonic meters is they can constantly check the frequencies and they can constantly check the timing of uh, the measurement. They can tell you and alert you if um, there's a problem, if there's a slug of water going down through the meter. Uh, they could e even completely stop measuring if they get to a position where, or a condition where they're not comfortable with their accuracy anymore. Any of those alarms will be sent not only on the LCD display, but back into the, the head end system. Every meter will have a pulse output. Uh, you don't have to order it special. It's there. Again, if you want it, you can use it. And that's our avenue to get information to third-party radios. So we'll actually have a different cover on the front of the meter that you'll be able to mount third-party radios if you still want to use the Sonics meter, um, but you may have somebody else's uh, AMI, AMR system in there. Um, with the, the Sonics IQ and the FlexNet radio there, um, you don't need that. It's constantly feeding you the information. To get all the features and the benefits out of the meter, um, you basically need the FlexNet radio and the FlexNet system. It will work in other systems and you'll get a volumetric pulse to the radio. But uh, other than that, um, all the intelligence is with our system. They do have an overrange capacity. The 250 overrange is 300 cubic foot before it stops measuring. And the 425 will go to 510 before it stops measuring. Now, if you put the meter under pressure, you automatically get a, an increase in capacity because the capacity of the uh, Sonics meters increases with the pressure multiplier. The capacity of a diaphragm meter only increases with the square root of the pressure multiplier. So at two pounds, a Sonics 250 or a Sonics 425 has more capacity than a diaphragm meter of a slightly larger size at the same two pound pressure. Um, so there's an advantage there. You really may not have to go to a two inch differential. Um, but no, there, there is no two inch differential. There is a bit of an over range there. Okay. And again, um, you can, if you want, fix factor the pressure compensation. So if you're on a two pound system, you can program the meter for pressure, atmospheric, and base, and it'll automatically do the calculation for you. Um, another advantage of the electronic platform is plus or minus 1% temperature correction. Um, bimetal elements and diaphragm meter are probably plus or minus 2%. They're only plus or minus 2% from minus 20 to plus 120 Fahrenheit. Sonics IQ is plus or minus 1% from minus 30 to plus 130 Fahrenheit. 
you're typically picking up 1% more accuracy at the colder temperatures when you're using more gas just by the accuracy of the thermistor within the meter itself. So uh, the dimensions of it, you can see it's very small. It weighs 6.3 pounds, and that's really an advantage, uh, especially for us old guys when you're hauling them around. You know, they're only like six and a half pounds. They're not even a, a bowling ball type of weight. Um, but all the logistics of the meter itself in shipping, handling, all the cost of warehousing and everything um, is it, it, just phenomenal. We can actually put close to 6,000 Sonics IQ meters on a trailer load. Typically, we can only put 2,500 or maybe 2,000 if they have the radio on them on a, of the R275 mechanical diaphragm meter. Okay, so you get almost three times more meters in a single shipment. And the limiting factor is the weight. You can only put about 43,000 pounds on a trailer. It's not the volume of the trailer. We can stuff more meters in, but we would exceed the weight of the trailer itself. We prefer that the connections are up. If you're in a closet or an inside set where it's not in a weather environment, then you can put it in different orientations. The meter will be shipped either in, in single boxes or in a six-pack box, six meters in a box. We actually ship them on their back. So um, the scrolling LCD, again, if you want to use it, you can. If, if you don't, it's there. And every six seconds, which is a Measurement Canada requirement, um, we have the, the display for six seconds, and then we can scroll to the next one. If you want, we can show corrected read, uncorrected, uh, pressure factor, if it's fixed factor, if you get the live pressure transducer in it, temperature, flow rate, and then it just cycles back through. Or we've had a request for what we call interleaving, where it'll show corrected and then show uncorrected. Show corrected, show your fixed or live pressure. Back to corrected, so that if for some reason the meter reader wanted to see the, the corrected uh, reading. We kept what we call protocol 8. So any of the SNAP, Energy Economics, uh, MSI, or the Nobels, they have the Protocol 8, which is the same as current Sonic technologies to prove the Sonic's IQ. All the provings through the optical uh, port on the front of it. Bell provings, can't do it. The provers, you can just, if the, if it's not, if the meter's not within your spec, which is very highly unlikely, um, you just push a button on the prover and it calculates a new calibration factor, programs the meter with it, and then reruns your open and check. We'll also have um, Sonics.com software, which I'll be talking about in the next class, that you can actually go in and manually change that calibration factor if you want. Um, but there should be very little need. Once we establish a correlation between your proving shop and our provers, um, they should just fly through. We're, right now we're thinking that um, the Sonics IQ will only have a speed adjustment. The current industrial commercials have the speed and the slope where we can rock the open and the check. Um, but we're thinking that the accuracy of it right now is so tight that uh, we may only need the speed. We can always add slope into it if need be, but hopefully not. Better to deal with one calibration factor than two. The alarm, some of you that are familiar with the current Sonics meters, um, you'll just see a C or an L or a B or an A, and you really don't know what caused that. We've actually added a C1, C2, C3, C4, B1, B2, B3. So you have more intelligence of what that alarm is but also on the LCD, it'll actually um, spell it out to you in, in abbreviated form that we can get in six characters on the LCD. So if it's uh, a C4, uh, means that the flow rate was out of range. Uh, end of life, we have L1 for uh, 19 and a half years and, and L2 for 20 years. Um, it's like your cell phone. If the battery dies, it, it dies too. You never lose any information. All the information is retained in flash memory. 
but all we have to do is power it back up and we can retain all the data logs and all the information in, in the settings. Um, we're also going to have something that we call the H or the persistence or historical. So the alarms, if it occurs and doesn't occur for 35 days, it'll automatically clear itself. But in that 35 days of it occurring, you'll see an H. So the meter was rebooted sometime within the last 35 days. And if that doesn't happen again, that B4H alarm goes away. So the H means that it's historical. It happened once, but in 35 days, it's automatically going to clear itself. With the meter reading, you'll get um, all the date, time, and location, and corrected volume, uncorrected volume, max, min, average temperature, max, min, average pressure, any alarms that have occurred. And if it's what we call a high level or a critical alarm, those are instantaneous. You'll get them right now through the, the FlexNet system. Yeah, it's not going to wait. If you do get a low battery, it'll, it'll, it'll bring up low bat on the LCD display and it'll actually send that back through the FlexNet system. But um, if, you go, if you interrogate it with SonicSOM or FieldLogic, you can actually see the battery voltage. It'll let you know what the battery voltage is. So no, we're not going to, I mean, it will let you know if you have a low battery but we're not going to have something that says, okay, your, your battery's at what voltage. It's a D-sized lithium battery. Now, if you just get the meter, it's one battery. If you get the meter with the radio, it's two batteries. All the electronic platform allows us to do a lot of automation in the factory. Um, we can do helium leak testing that's all basically automatic. Um, it tells you whether it leaks or not. If it doesn't leak, it goes down the line. If it leaks, it gets kicked out to be looked at. Proving, uh, we talked a little bit about proving. Uh, we're using the MSI provers. Um, we hit a button, we say start the test, and it runs through the test. It automatically calculates that speed factor, programs it in, and puts it within the open and check limits that, that we want it to be in. It, it's all automated. Um, we are in beta testing right now of the meter with the radio. Uh, we have some installation here. That's the comparison of a 250 with a 250 diaphragm meter with our radio on it. Um, here's a 400 class diaphragm meter with our radio on it and a 400 class Sonics IQ meter. Okay, Much smaller, much more compact, fits in uh, a lot better in different applications. Next phase, we're going to add a remote shutoff and pressure measurement, and along with that comes a whole lot of uh, what we call census analytics or apps that we can do now, uh, pressure profiling, we can do load surveying, we can take a look at the daily information that's coming in from the meter um, and say, hey, something has changed. Maybe somebody added an instantaneous hot water tank and didn't tell you, and now the meter's undersize and you're getting flow out of range alarms. The valve uh, within the meter, it'll be the two-way flex net system. So for uh, natural disasters, customer calls in and says, I smell gas. First responders, an accident, construction uh, situations, um, pipeline breakage, uh, overpressurization because of a, a malfunctioning regulator gate station. Um, the meter will shut off on high and low pressure. Uh, rapid temperature, we're probably thinking we're going to get rid of because the high temperature limit will take care of that. Um, we originally thought we were going to put a rapid temperature rise, it, so many degrees per minute, um, but we're just, I think we're going to eliminate that and just go with high temperature. Air in the meter, reverse flow, excess flow. If you want, if you have the meter with the valve, you can program it for limits to shut off on any of those characteristics. You don't have to be there. It'll automatically shut off and then send you all the information saying, hey, I shut off because I've, I have a high pressure situation or I shut off because now I've exceeded my flow capacity for that meter or somebody's trying to tamper with it, they pull it off, now there's air in the meter and the valve shuts off. When they go to try to put the meter back in, gas won't flow. So now they got to call the utility and say, hey, 
take a look at my meter, um, and then they find out, hey, the meter was in air, um, and you have to manually open the valve. So it's two-way, can be shut off locally within the meter itself. The meter can shut itself off by parameters that you program in. You can shut it off locally with a laptop or handhold field logic or um, SonXCOM through the optical cable. Or you can do it through our FlexNet system. You can shut off one meter. You can shut off 10 meters. You can shut off 1,000 meters within um, a group or an area that you want. Uh, all of the meters, you'll have to manually be at the meter to open the valve back up. Every, all the valve is open with the optical port on on the face of the meter. That's the only way you can open it. Little different philosophy in North America. In Europe, um, they're allowed, the utilities are allowed to open the valve uh, remotely. They have a protocol that the homeowner has to go through, and if they go through that protocol, then they can call the utility and they can open the valve remotely. So I may not see it in my lifetime, but maybe in North America we'll, we'll go to there. The meter will measure a leak flow, so if the valve is shut off and it's still measuring flow, we'll get an information back. The valve has a, a, an open and a closed sensor in it, so it will actually tell us whether it's successfully closed or uh, dent or it successfully is open. Um, and then there's a current measurement of how much current it, the, the motor takes to operate the valve. And the valve will be cycled, it'll, it'll open and close uh, periodically, not to completely shut off the gas, but just to cycle it to make sure that it's moving and if anything's dislodged. It'll do a three retry. If it, if it detects something blocking it, it'll open back up and try to close. And then, and then you'll get an alarm saying, my valve attempted to close, but it didn't close. So we're monitoring uh, the valve being closed or open like four or five different characteristics. We're, we're trying to get rid of badges. So all of the information hopefully will be laser etched. We do, we do make a provision to put a badge on and it'll be stuck on the tape if a utility really, really wants their badge. But we'll be able to laser etch your logo, your information, your, your customer number right on the face of it. And our engineers have actually painted it with, with latex paint, and spray paint, and everything. And if you take a spongy, you can actually just rub over it, and you can read the information, and you can actually read the barcode. So it, it's pretty robust. We think it's more robust than a badge, um, because a badge you can peel off and off you go. Um, again, this is all part of the manufacturing, where at the end of the line, we don't have a person sticking a badge on with a number, customer number that has to match up with the meter serial number that has to match up with the FlexNet radio number. Here, it's all programmed in and it's automatically laser etched and it just increments one meter after the next meter after the next meter. And then all of our approval information, intrinsic safety and eventually measurement Canada will all be laser etched into the cover itself.